We've been speaking about grace technology, and grace is the substance from an eternal realm that must be administered in an earthly realm. The Hebrew word is chen, which means to favor, and the Greek word is charis, which means a divine endowment and divine enablement. We will become casualties of the spirit of this age without grace. We will become casualties of our habits, casualties in our marriages, casualties to the spirit of mammon. But grace is the substance of the kingdom of God. Grace is the substance that works on the inside of us. It is the mustard seed. It is the leaven that works inside of us, enabling you every day to overcome Satan, to overcome the flesh, to overcome the world. And you must value grace at all costs. All over the world, in many parts of our country, like in our church, I think even in the next two weeks, you will have pastor's appreciation, but I don't like the word, I'd rather call it honor, it's a better biblical word. Why should you honor the one who is part of the leadership or the leader of the church who brings you the word of God? It's because they carry the substance of grace. So grace comes to us and we must value it. You must look at ways to consistently increase your grace quotient. Grace is God's insurance plan for your life. And whilst you live in an age where there's so many things that are going wrong, I can tell you something that this substance called grace is able to help you overcome. The Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. Yet he was tempted in every way and without sin. He overcame the temptations of this life through the substance of grace. And in 1 Timothy 1.14, Paul says to Timothy, the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant. So grace comes to enable you. In Philippians 2.13, it says it's God who works in us to will and to do. First thing about enabling grace, enabling grace comes to give you courage when you are discouraged. In Acts 13 and verse number 43, the congregation and the people were with Paul and the Jews were wanting to persecute Paul, but they encouraged them to continue in the grace of God. As we speak to you today, I pray divine enablement to give you courage when you are discouraged. That's what happened with Elijah. Elijah was discouraged, but he sat under a tree. The angel came, fed him with food, and as he ate the food, he was able to continue in his journey. The next thing that the grace of God does is the grace of God brings hope in times of despair. When you watch the news, whether it's CNN, SABC, or whatever news channel you're watching, you can't get any hope. Because it's, it's all despair all over. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 16, May our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and hope. When you have enablement grace, you can endure suffering. It is because of the grace of God that you are able to continue. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So you are able now, as a son of God, to endure sufferings. So let the weak say, I am strong this morning. You are also enabled to serve. Yesterday we dealt with many issues in our communications workshop. You can't serve. I can't serve. I can't save a soul. It is God who works in us to will and to do. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 28, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve acceptably. Let us have grace by which we may serve acceptably. So you receive grace to serve. I find that a lot of people today can't serve. When I was growing up in church 30, 40 years ago, everyone was doing something. 
coming early to church. Somebody would set the flowers on the table. How many of you know that? Some people would come and wipe the floors. As we are growing economically, fewer and fewer people are serving in the house of God. If you phone me tomorrow morning, I will tell you of a thousand things you can do in this church. But we need grace to serve. Amen? But today I want to talk to you about another type of enabling grace. This message this morning, if you know how to receive it, will revolutionize your life. But if you despise it, belittle it, you will wander like the nation of Israel in the wilderness. And God will leave our carcasses waste in the wilderness. But if you are able to grab it, you will enter the promised land very quickly. Today I want to speak to you about enablement grace for giving. There's a grace that comes from God to give. Many people say they can only give because they can afford to give. Now we live amongst many great philanthropists and those philanthropists give large sums of money because they have large sums of money. But you and I, who are part of the church of Jesus Christ, we need grace to be givers. And many people within the body of Christ struggle with giving. But there is a divine enablement that must come upon every one of us to cause us to become givers. You can't do it in your own strength. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in us to will and to do. Now you must realize today that giving is a big part of your spiritual DNA. Because you're a son of God and you are born again of the spirit, the DNA that is in you is your father's. So there's something called the doctrine of emanation. You emanate from the father. And because you emanate from the father and the father is a giver and you are his firstborn son, you too should be just like your father. You don't take a dog to barking school. The dog just barks. And you as a son of God, certain things should come naturally to you. The nation of Israel cried out in their distress whilst they were in Egyptian bondage and God gave them Moses. God gave them manna, quail, water. God gave them the priesthood. So God by nature is a giver. He said to them, I will give you land. He says to the people, I will give you victory over all your enemies. He gave them a king. In his generosity, he gave them victory over all the enemies. David had it. For Solomon, God gave him victory. You all know John 3.16. For God so loved that he gave. The very essence and substance of Father God is that he is a giver. And if you are his son, then you carry his DNA. And we should display that nature. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father. Now, when money enters into your account, oh, certain endorphins get released. When that ping comes on the 25th, for those of you who are fortunate enough to get paid on the 25th. And let me tell you, nowadays getting paid and receiving a salary is a gift from God. But the Bible says something very interesting. God doesn't love a cheerful receiver. God loves a cheerful giver. So all of you must receive grace to give. But there's not only money you can give. There's not only money. You can give your time. You can give your skill. Bezalel and Aholiab, they gave their skill in the construct of the tabernacle of Moses. We need skills in the house of God for the forward movement of the kingdom. This grace comes upon you and when the grace to give comes upon you, you are able to give. Sometimes after you've given, you'll go home and you say, Lord, what did I do? Sometimes you pledge and you don't know what happened, but you pledged it. And God empowers you. God enables you somehow to do it. 
I wish today I could reveal to you how much we've had to release between January 1st and the 15th of October. Each of us today, I'm praying that God enables you. The grace to give enables you to be obedient. Enables you. The ultimate purpose of your sonship is obedience. Adam's biggest problem was that he was disobedient to the instruction. Adam was disobedient. People said Adam sinned. So disobedience is equal to sin. Now all of you as you're sitting here, you know individually your budget. More or less you know, end of the month the school fees is this and sure the school fees feels like a bond payment some days. You know the budget of your house and we must desire this grace to give. You know why? This grace to give is the only thing that will allow us to live an overflowing life and bring us to the place where we are the head and not the tail, where we are above and not beneath. It is the grace to give. This grace must come upon this family. There will always be enough. Poverty gets broken when people become givers. Stingy people. Oh, I pray today God helps us. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is our keynote text. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's speaking to them about the churches of Macedonia. Now the churches of Macedonia included the church at Thessalonica, Philippi, and Berea. Macedonia was basically a province that had these three churches in the region. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, writing to the church at Corinth, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, two dots, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Verse 3 says this, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. We'll go to verse 4 as well. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. So this church at Corinth was struggling to give. Corinth had no lack of money. They had a deficiency of grace to give. So Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 8, I'm going to send to you Titus who's going to complete this gift in you. And he says, I want to make known to you, verse 1, the grace of God. The Macedonian church had a special grace upon them. Paul is teaching that there is a grace to give. Paul is teaching that giving is a grace. Paul is basically saying, there's a question, what gives? What gives? It's not you. It's not me. It's grace that gives. In this portion of scripture, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the word grace is mentioned seven times. In these two chapters, Paul is dealing with giving, but he's using the word grace on several occasions. Grace is divine enablement, empowerment, allowing you to function and to obey. So if you're finding it difficult to obey, there is a grace deficiency. Every time you obey God's word, it is a display of the grace of God that is at work in us. Financial giving and compliance in the house of God flows from the rich reservoir of grace that is in you. This rich reservoir of grace communicates grace to the recipient. But what happens? What happens to the person who is the donor? The person who is the giver? He accesses more grace. That's how you get grace upon grace. 
the church at Corinth, if we study the Corinthian church, they knew about spiritual gifts. They had the technology, they had the money, they had the stuff, but they lacked in the area of giving. And Paul is praising the Macedonians for their abundant giving in severe poverty. Now verse 2 will tell you, 2 Corinthians 8 two, the Macedonians had the grace not just to give, but to give liberally. You can give within a limit. You can give within the law. But when grace comes upon you, it propels you to move beyond the law. The law was our tutor, just our guide to bring us to Christ. Galatians says that the law was our tutor. Christ never gave 10%. He gave his life. The Macedonian church was able to give in the midst of trials and tribulations. How could the Macedonians do this? Verse 1, Paul answers it. He says, by the grace of God bestowed upon them. This church had the grace to give. Paul was sending Titus to them. And he says, I'm going to send you Titus to complete it. So if Paul is saying, I'm sending Titus to you, that means there's something in the grace to give that is incomplete. And Paul wants these people to Use the Macedonians as a template and as a model. When you function from the completed grace of giving. Giving is not something you try. Giving is something you live. Giving is not an activity you do. But it becomes the person you are. You will find that the Macedonians had so much of trials. They were giving liberally because the grace of God was bestowed upon them. A deficiency in giving showcases a deficiency in grace. The converse is also true. Generous, bountiful, overflowing giving showcases an abundance of grace. The word charis means divine enablement. But it has some very interesting meanings if you go deeper into the Greek word charis. It means the beneficiary of divine enablement will overflow with joy and the person who has the charis of God has a strong desire to express this grace through generous giving. Christ was full of grace. Full of grace. So what happened? He started to give and give and give. Let me give you an example outside of giving. Let's say you are sick and you are in a hospital. But when you have grace, you are not worried about your own sickness. You start going around the whole hospital ward praying for everyone else. When you have grace... You will go through your own depression. You'll lose loved ones. But you'll find yourself encouraging other people. That means in your state of poverty, emotionally, in your state of poverty physically, you are able from deep poverty and brokenness to still give. This is what we need in the church of Jesus Christ. When you receive the grace to give, you are able to do things you are unable to do in your own strength. If we are fully to understand financial giving, you must understand it is born out of the core nature of God's grace. Giving is an expression of grace. Christ is full of grace and truth. John 1.14, full of grace and truth. And we have a God who has a super abundance of grace. We serve a God that is inexhaustible. The store is inexhaustible. And sometimes, sometimes our giving when we come to church is meager. It is paltry. It is scant. 
and it is a reflection of the deficiency of grace it is a reflection of the mindset because we are giving not out of the vastness of grace in our father oh when your grace quotient increases your giving increases when your gq increases you understand that you can give because of god's grace you can give out of god's grace and that grace seeks not just to give but to do it as generously as possible so when i come to church i'm not tipping a car guard no i want to do it as best as i can when i give a gift i'm not giving the gift because i want to impress somebody i want to give because i want to express who my father is through the gift that is why god the father gave us his son his superlative best that is why christ gave himself as a ransom how do you know you are growing in grace this takes time to bring to you my friends this takes work it means searching the scriptures day and night listening to people reading material buying material and you know what my desire is my desire is for everyone in this family to have a cup that runs over i preach and teach these messages so you and your children will overflow with grace my desire is to teach you how to come out of poverty so that you can be the best possible advertisement of the message we preach of the kingdom of god of our faith to your neighborhood to your community to your family and friends so i know how to abase and i know how to abound Amen. i'll say it like paul my wife is sitting here both she and i know how to eat the smallest of meals and we know how to eat caviar Amen. i can eat herbs and dal and kalabash and be very happy but i want you to be wealthy first 3 for i bear witness that according to their ability and yes beyond their ability they were freely willing they were not giving according to their ability they were giving beyond their ability i have 7000 rand in my bank account how much can i give 7000 but i have overdraft that's 50000 rand and these banks they do a bad thing they say available balance they don't tell you what your real balance is available balance 57 so when i go beyond my ability i'm stepping into this facility the unknown all of us got it and we use it 99.9% of the time when you study the macedonian church you find the grace of god produced abundant joy despite their suffering the macedonians were outgiving the corinthians <laughs> the poor macedonians were outgiving the corinthians grace gives <laughs> the corinthians lacked the grace to give whilst the macedonians were excelling in their giving grace gives the generosity of the macedonians was not related to their current context or condition their condition was great affliction and poverty their condition did not hinder hamper or impede their giving in fact their lavish crazy giving defied their condition how could they do this grace gives second corinthians 8 9 he says for you know for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that through his poverty you might become rich the grace of giving was resident in the lord jesus christ 
And this grace that was in him had no problems in impoverishing himself. He impoverished himself to enrich others. Grace does not count the cost when it comes to eternal purpose. Grace simply obeys. Grace is willing to inconvenience itself so others can be convenienced. When you as a son of God come to this grace, you too will have no problem in inconveniencing yourself. This environment of Santon Johannesburg only seeks to convenience itself. My neighbor next door, no, he's in that position because he made the wrong decision. I'm not going to be bothered about him. The person sitting next to you at church, no, hey, you know, it's so far to drive to four ways. I live right here in Kempton Park. Oh, I'm going to drive all the way there to see someone. But grace is ready to inconvenience itself. When you study the history of the Macedonian church, the Bible speaks of a gift that they gave. The gift was money. The gift was not a PS5 or 6 or a BMW X5. They gave money. They gave resource. And they did it repeatedly and continually. That's what Paul was sending Titus to complete it in the Corinthians. When the Macedonians gave to Paul, Paul was able to be delivered from his secular employment of tent making. Historians tell you that. So yeah, Paul was tent making, preaching the gospel. Tent making, suddenly the Macedonians say, no Paul, we see too much value in you to be doing this. No, we want you to serve God. We want to make sure that every resource is given to you. We Macedonians, we will live in poverty. We will be inconvenienced, but you must be convenienced as a servant of God. Now watch what happens. Paul gives us Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Paul suddenly starts to write. Could it be, this is my hypothesis, could it be that the giving of the Macedonians released the scribal grace in Paul to bring the word of God alive? Could it be? You have that Bible in your hand, on your app, because a Macedonian people were inconvenienced and ready to release the one sent to them. Any one of you tried to write a book? You know what it takes? It takes discipline. It takes time. It also takes knowing that everything is met in the background. Paul could write and wait on God and give himself to the word and to prayer because a people who are poor were ready to say, go Paul, go Paul, go, 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 right. The grace to give comes from two things. Love and grace. Love and grace go together. For God so loved that he gave. Love and grace must be the stimulus for all our giving. When you read the book of Corinthians, the Corinthians lacked both grace and love. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 was written by Paul to give you love is patient, love is kind, all of that. They didn't lack money. They lack grace and love. Money in the hand of a grace deficient believer is worthless. And it can become and will become the root of all kinds of evil. Second Corinthians 13 verse 14. Now this is the closing words of Paul 
to the church at Corinth. Not coincidental, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Trinity, the Godhead is mentioned there. So Paul is saying that the Lord Jesus imparts grace. Then he says the love of God the Father. The Father imparts love. And then Paul writes about the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is the means through which the love of the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is received. The love of the Father and the grace of Christ find their greatest expression and make their greatest impression through our giving. This grace gives for the benefit of another. That's what Jesus did. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It gives selflessly. It gives sacrificially. It gives without counting the cost to his or her self. When grace gives, not you. When Christ gave, he placed priority on the needs of others. Look at the story of the Good Samaritan. That was grace at work. He was ready to be inconvenienced whilst the priest and the Levite, all their religious garments and all the religious stuff walked by on the other side. They did not want to be inconvenienced. But that good Samaritan was a picture of Christ was ready to take you who are on that road to Jericho, put you in the inn, his church, get an innkeeper, your pastor. Pay the innkeeper and said, when I come again, that's the good Samaritan. In 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, God says to Elijah, I have commanded a widow of Zarephath. It was famine, it was drought, there was no food. But God says to Elijah, I have commanded a widow. God had already enabled and empowered the widow to do what she was unable to do in her distress. If the word of God says, bring the tithe into the stars, in the command of God, in the expectation of God, is the empowerment of God. God will always capacitate you to fulfill or do his commands. When you see someone and you know you can meet a need, don't say, let them suffer. Sometimes you'll have to go and pray with the person. But inconvenience yourself. There was a little boy, Luke chapter 9, who had lunch. Now, anybody got small boys growing up. Boys like to eat all the time. What's to eat, mom? What's to eat? That cupboard, that fridge is opening all the time. The little boy, Luke 9, takes his lunch, goes for a crusade. He's perpetually hungry. And this miracle takes place where 5,000 people, excluding women and children, ate. The miracle was a result of a little boy willing to part with his lunch. As young as this boy was, there was a measure of grace that was resident in him. I want us to start teaching our children about giving from the time they can understand. It is my conviction that nothing else but the grace of God was at work. But what he gave, he gave bread and he gave fish. Bread speaks of the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. And the fish is metaphorically the diet of the spirit. Because when Jesus resurrected and when he was wanting to show himself to his disciples, you know that he was preparing a meal of fish for them. That's why on Easter Sunday you'll all eat fish. I always wondered why my mother-in-law was making this fish all the time on Easter Sunday. But he's got bread and he's got fish. The bread and the fish are loaded with grace. His giving was an expression of grace. What was the result? The result was exponential increase 
In fact, that boy that day ate more fish and bread than he would have ever thought possible. Now it gets interesting. When grace gives, the giver is never placed in a disadvantaged position. When grace gives, see, you think hey, this bonus came, this two million rand came. Don't give the 200,000 rand. Think about how you're going to give from grace. Now this thing came into my hand. What am I going to do? We're going to go to Maldives. You are not meant to just go on a holiday or vacation to an island. You are meant to walk on water. God will give you and he will give you more and he will give you more because nothing tests a man like wealth. Wealth is the greatest test of a man's character, not poverty. You know how we say money makes people funny? But if you're a son of God, case study two, Abraham. Abraham is known as the father of faith. Abraham was promised that he would have a son, he would have a father, he would become a father of many nations. But he tries in his flesh to produce something. We've got the problem today. Abraham, why did you do that? So Abraham in his flesh tries to produce in his faithless, fleshly state, he produces an Ishmael. But then God in Genesis chapter 17, God says, no, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to move your name from Abram to Abraham. He puts the H in. And the H is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The fifth letter. And the number five is the number of grace. So there's a before and there's an after. In his flesh, without the grace of God, he is producing Ishmael. But now, in his graceful state, as Abraham, he is able to produce Isaac. In his graceful state, through him, a nation is born. Through him, the son of God is born. Grace is able to produce that's not it. Grace is able to produce. It's able to reproduce. Grace is able to generate. But watch this. What grace generates. Grace is freely willing to give up. The grace of God in Abraham caused him to produce Isaac. Come on, 99, 100 years old. The old man is old, can't have a son. But he's able to generate a son with Sarah. But what it generates. See when you come to the understanding. When you and I as sons of God come to the understanding. That it's not you who wills and to do. It's not by your ability that you have the job. You have the career. It is the grace of God that is in you. Then grace is generating stuff in you. The income, the business, things are turning. It's not you, it's grace. What grace generates, it's freely willing to come and say, what do you need, Lord? Oh, you need my son Isaac? Here it is. We truly come to the knowledge that all we have is the results of God's enabling grace. You have no issue Pastor, it's not a problem. I received a million rand. I'm happy to part with 200,000 rand as a tithe. Because it wasn't me, it was grace. When you come to realize that it all is because of his grace, you give it away. When grace gives, goes beyond the status quo. Goes beyond the initial pain. It doesn't count the cost. It doesn't count... The transcendent suffering. You see the harvest. That's what the Macedonians saw. They saw the harvest. The enabling grace of God will cause you to give your first fruit. To honor the Lord with your tithe. To give offerings. Paul was saying, I want to complete this gift through Titus in you, Corinthians. 
Because you Corinthians need to become continual, repetitive and serial givers. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. When grace gives, the joy of the harvest far outweighs the painful cost of the moment. There was a lady in the Bible, her name was Hannah. And Hannah means grace. It means a gratuitous gift. Those of you who are trusting God for some things to be born in your life. Listen, it might not just be physical children, but it might be some things to be born in your life. I want to show you what needs to happen. So here is this lady, she's trusting God for a child. But God supernaturally intervenes, heals her, and her prayers are answered. God grants her her son. Hannah is pleading for her son, but watch what she does. She makes a vow to give the boy back. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. Then she made a vow. Now this is not someone who's uncovenantal. People who make vows are very covenantal. She says, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, I will. Who's giving? What's her name? What does Hannah mean? What gives? I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Hannah desires something from the Lord. How many of you have desires from the Lord? Hannah desires something from the Lord. And when she desires it, she desires it not for her own gain. She desires to give it back to the Lord. She desires to release it to the Lord. See, when grace desires something, grace desires it to release it back to the Lord. She had the faith to receive and she had the grace to give back. There is something radically wrong with the 21st century church. We have the faith to believe God to receive, but we don't have the faith to give. She gives to the Lord. She doesn't give her last born son. She gives her first and her only. She gives to the Lord and the Lord responds by giving her five more children. Five is a number of grace. When grace gave, grace never lost. The Lord miraculously capacitates the womb to produce again and again and again. See, Hannah knew I'm connected to an inexhaustible source. Samuel was not part of a priestly lineage. But Hannah is watching what's happening in the temple. Eli is the priest and the priest got two rascal sons. Grace in Hannah caused her to give but she gave because there was a deficiency in Israel. Hophni and Phinehas, the guys that were going to be the heirs to the throne or come into the priesthood, these guys were rascal. They were corrupt. And she said, I'm watching this. I'm watching this, Lord. And she says, no, no, no. If you give me a son, then from my womb, we will raise the standard in Israel. Now watch this. She did not ask for her own comfort and convenience, for her own release and relief. She asked for the kingdom of God. When your request is aligned to eternal divine purposes, God responds with a super abundance from heaven. Pray for things that will benefit the kingdom of God. Samuel judged Israel. He anointed Saul as king. He anointed David as king. The Bible says, and none of his words fell to the ground. And all the days of Samuel's life, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistine. Here is a man who's got no 
ability to go to war. But the Lord kept one of Israel's most formidable enemies away all the days of Samuel's life. Why? The grace. The divine enablement. I hope today God has spoken. I hope you're ready to become inconvenient for the convenience of someone else. Someone wants you to walk one mile, go two mile. As a son of God, you must be ready, like the Lord Jesus Christ, to move beyond yourself, to impoverish yourself, because you realize that I'm connected to a God who's full of grace.